So here I'm going to talk about how to do vector autoregressive methods in R. I'm going to use a macroeconomic data analysis example, and I'm going to show you how to do the main tools that are used in a basic macroeconomics project. Okay. Now before I do the actual VAR stuff, I'm going to import the data directly from Fred, which is a good skill to have, make my variables without loading a data set. And at the end, I've got some special code for plotting impulse response functions. Um, sometimes you could use the default, but sometimes you do want to customize. Okay. And the three tools that a lot of uh, papers will use are the impulse response functions, showing the uh, response to a shock to a variable, Granger causality, and the effects of one variable on another, like, and then forecast error variance decompositions. They, those show how much of the uh, variance of, of, of one variable is caused by shocks to the others. Okay, so I'm assuming you do know those, um, but I'm going to show you how to do it in R. Okay, and so to begin, we're going to get the data from Fred. Okay, so I'm going to use two packages here, QuantMod and, and VARS. You might need to install those. I'm going to pull them from the directory. Okay, and then I get the data from Fred. The model that I'm going to do is, is from the literature. Um, I'm using it for teaching purposes, so I tweaked it so I get some results that we can interpret. Um, but uh, basically, this is Mexican capital flows, the Mexican capital financial account, as a function of Mexican money and U.S. interest rates, as well as real GDP in both countries. So it's monetary and financial var variables and real variables in those two countries. Capital financial account using an international finance identity is change in reserves minus the current account. Okay, I tweaked this just because you know, different variations. I wanted to have some significant and some insignificant responses. All right, so we have our model. Cap we're modeling capital financial account. We're modeling capital flows. Now, uh, we're going to pull the data from Fred using the QuantMod package. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use this code here. So with the set defaults, gets the symbols, and the source is Fred. And we pull it in. And this is the, the base time series that we got from from Fred directly, and it goes from 2006 to uh, the fourth quarter of 2019. And then, so I'm going to make my current account variable first, set this variable that I just pulled as a time series with this hard coded end date. So it's 2019 4, the fourth quarter, the frequency of four. And we see that it's in percentage points of GDP. So it's a deficit of 1.42%. So we're modeling this capital financial account as percentage points of GDP. Now, to get there, we're going to use reserves, which are in US dollars. And as a percentage of GDP, pesos are, excuse me, GDP is in pesos, so we're going to have to do a couple of steps to turn it into percentage points. And so we're going to pull the nominal GDP, okay, and this is also quarterly, but then we're also going to get the peso dollar rate to turn pesos into to dollars because reserves are in dollars, okay? Now, if you pull this one, you see from this date that, that the variable I pull here, the, the exchange rate, ends in 2020 first quarter, so I'm going to set my end date here, and then to get the peso, uh, the, excuse me, turn pesos into dollars, I simply uh, divide the exchange rate here, okay? Now, I'm going to pull reserves to get my uh, series here in dollars, and I do the same thing I just did, and then I use my formula. I take the change in reserves, um, and then uh, turn it into dollars here, or, excuse me, take my reserves, and I'm going to divide it by the dollar GDP, excuse me, and then if I look at my mean, it's about 1.44%, right? So it's negative current account, basically. Reserves are pretty small, okay? So this is positive because current account is negative, okay? So now I have my variable of interest, which is capital financial account. Now, to get my explanatory variables, I've got M1. I do the same thing. If I pull it, if you look here, it ends in 2018. So that's going to define my series. It's going to go from about 2006 to 2018. Okay, having that extra uh, quarter at the beginning of 2020 actually gets cut off. Um, I'm going to do the same thing for uh, U.S. interest rate, Fed funds rate, and U.S. GDP. Again, I'm just doing the same thing a couple of times. And then I've got Mexican real GDP as well. So I'm doing the same code to get all my variables. Okay, now I'm going to take logs of all my variables, which follows the literature. I'm going to take the logs of the U.S. interest rate just because I get some results that work. You can play around with the different variations, but I'm taking logs of the variables here, and I'm not deflating money supply or anything. This would be nominal money supply. All right, now I'm going to give them the names that I want, and I'm going to store the names in case I lose them when I difference. Now, to plot, these are my, you can see how short KFA is, so we're going to actually just only do this part of the series. But you can see these are going to be non-stationary. Uh, 
and so forth, we're going to do stationary, te stationary tests. Okay, we see that we have 51 quarters for five variables. I always take a look at the data by plotting and looking at the dimensions. Now, here's some code to, to test for stationarity. I run a loop to get the phillips perron test. I start making a null set, and then for one to five, because I got five columns, I run the PP test, put the results here, and then I'm going to populate my null set with only the p-value from this test. So from one to five, I run the test, and I store the p-value, and I put it in a table. I don't name it here. I could. I could assume. I could, I could assign the the column name, and I could assign the row names, but I don't. You can see right here only KFA is stationary at, at one percent. So these are all non-stationary, even interest rate. So I'm going to do the first difference here. So I'm going to do differences for the logs. I'm getting percentage change, and so I'm going to make my data, all right, of of those differenced variables. Now I'm going to omit any NAs. So now I have only the data here, and we can plot that just, if, or we can just run it, see what it looks like. Okay, and you can see here that it goes all the way from, uh, you know, 2006 up. Okay, so this is the variables we're working with. Okay, now, now we're gonna, we're actually gonna start with the IRF. Of, of those three tools, I'm gonna do IRFs first. Okay, just because this is what I use the most. So I'm going to make a new vector autoregressive, you know, it's a data frame here that's the data so that I don't lose my original. And then I'm going to use the VARS library. Okay, and I'm going to make this, this is the code for making your, your vector autoregressive. Now, this is just going to have a constant, no trend. I'm going to have possible four legs, but I'm going to choose the lag length from the Schwartz Bayesian criterion. So this is the criterion, the lag max. This is constant or trend here. And so this is the thing I'm going to make. And so for here, I'm going to do from one to four. Remember, there's five variables. So I'm going to test shocks to the first four, and I'm going to run one, two, three, four using this loop. Okay, so I is going to be one through four, and the response is going to be five, which is the capital financial account. Now, remember, this is uh, the, uh, it's going to be a lower triangular uh, matrix. And that's important to know because different software has different uh, ordering of variables. In this way, you actually lay it out so the thing that is affected most goes first and the thing that is affected least goes last. It's lower triangular. The one at the bottom is affected by all the other variables. The one at the top is not. Okay, And so uh, th this is laid out in order up here with, with uh, the way I have the ordering. I have the U.S. GDP affecting everything else. And then I have real variables affecting financial variables and so forth. The U.S. affects Mexico all the way to KFA being the thing that is uh, most en exogenous. Um, and so the way, so that is already laid out properly. Okay, now I've got my loop, all right, where I'm going to do from, remember, the four explanatory variables affecting the fifth, and I'm going to plot each one here, okay? Now, this is what the default settings look like for an IRF. Okay, you can see right here. It's laying them out. And we have uh, our four IRFs here, orthogonalized, Cholesky decomposition, uh, pretty standard in the literature. And now we have, uh, this is the impact from Mexican money supply in the KFA. So an increase in Mexican money supply actually reduces these capital flows. Now, if we look at the rest of them, all right, increase in Mexican GDP increases capital flows. You can see that it is significant because it's positive, but and also, the lower bound here is also positive. And so these are the plus and minus two standard error bands. This is how you show that it's significantly positive. This is also positive right here, but it is not significant. Okay. Now, the other two are not going to be significant here. It's positive, but the error bands cross zero. So you can say that this is insignificant. All right, and likewise, the effect of U.S. GDP is insignificant. Now, you can make more inferences. Again, this is a teaching tool, but that's how you would interpret the results. Now, I'm going to move on to uh, the forecast error variance decompositions. Usually, I don't lay out every one. I'm going to do it at a 12-quarter horizon, but I only lay out 1, 4, 8, and 12. So basically immediate, and then 1, 2, 3 years. I am going to do the forecast error variance decomposition here of the VAR that I, VAR that I already made for 12 steps ahead. And then I am going to save only the, the FEVD from the variable I want. This is going to generate five, one for each variable. I only care about KFA right now. And then I'm going to make my table, which is going to round. Uh, this would say 20%, for example, would be 0.2. I'm going to make it so it's, it's 20. I usually use it percentage points. And then I only use the rows that I want. And it's only going to be the, this column here. I'm going to assign the row names 
right only I'm going to give the numbers back and then I'm going to print it and you can plot it too I don't know how, how much that helps but here is my table you can see KFA is mostly affected by itself but money Mexican money supply and Mexican GDP do play pretty big roles Mexican GDP contributes 15 percent of the variance we saw it was significant and this was also significant Right, so that kind of matches those IRFs. These plots look nice. I don't use them too much, but sometimes people want to do it visually. And you can see here that this lays out all of them. So for KFA, uh, you can see which, which ones play the most role. Okay. Now, some people start with Granger causality tests. I'm just doing it third here. Um, I put the code in so that if you did do it first, it could stand alone. But right now, you can see that I'm going to do, again, like IRFs, I'm going to show the shock to each variable, one to four, on the fifth variable, which is the capital financial account. Um, one thing that I'm doing here is I'm making them pairwise. So I'm actually going to make a new variable that just strips out one and five, two and five, three and five, and four and five, do it four times. I'm going to do the causality command here for my new VAR that I made. I'm going to have the, the cause is the call name, one, and then the impulse is going to be the only, the, excuse me, the response is going to be the only other one there. I'm also going to have my blank table and I'm going to populate. I'm going to make a nice table with my Granger results. Okay, and the column names are going to be the statistic and the p-value. And I'm going to pull the statistic and the t-value out of the test that I made and put them into the table. So this code will actually extract all the items that I need for the table here. Okay, so if I run it here, oops, I did not include my null table. And here I run it, and it runs it four times for the four explanatory variables. And you can see, again, Mexican GDP and Mexican M1 are indeed significant. Those are the variables that have the significant effect on Mexican capital flows. All right, so that's what we did. We pulled data from Fred, and we ran those three tests. We did impulse response functions, forecast error variance decompositions, and also Granger causality tests. And we were able to make economic inferences. All right, we saw that Mexican money supply and Mexican GDP did have significant effects. And that was shown actually by all three of the tests. Now, finally, I'm going to make my own IRFs here. Okay, so this is my code that I wrote, so you don't have to go with the defaults. All right? Um, you don't have to go with what R gives you over here. So this is how I do it. First, I make my, I'm going to run it from 0 to 6. Okay, so instead of 1 to 7. So this is going to be my x-axis. I'm going to make, use the PIR command to make a two-by-two two plot. Remember, I have four variables, right? And these are going to be uh, just arranged pretty nicely in one graph. And then for one to four, I'm going to do my IRFs again, but I'm going to extract the IRF, right, the line that's the actual black line here. And then I'm also going to extract the lower and the upper confidence bands, right, so I can plot them myself. And then I'm going to plot them all together. Okay, I'm going to make superimpose them on, and here is all my code for making the lines customized for how I want. I've got uh, the common y limits so that they plot nicely. It's going to be 120% of the minimum and the maximum. And then I'm going to have a zero line through here. So it's going to look pretty similar, but it's customized. I could change it however I want. Okay, so this is the code that I wrote. All right, and if I run it, it's going to it's going to run these IRFs again. And you can see that this is the shocks to USY, USR, MXY, and MXM1. And if you zoom in, you see here it looks exactly like what R did for its default. Okay, so that's a little bit extra. Okay, that's the I like to customize stuff. I like to show that you can visualize it however you want. All right. So in addition to doing those tools, pulling the data, doing the VAR analysis. Um, I also showed you how you can plot your own IRFs without res resort resorting to R defaults.